Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave. As your JavaScript knowledge increases, closure is a very important concept to understand. Let's talk about it. It is important to understand scope as we discuss closure. And I will link to my tutorial on scope in the description below. But first, let's start off with defining lexical scope. Lexical scope defines how variable names are resolved in nested functions. And therefore, if we have a child function within a parent function, the child function has access to the scope of the parent function and has access to the global scope. Nested child functions have access to the scope of their parent functions. But this is often confused with closure. But lexical scope is only an important part of closure. It is not the entire thing. So let's start off with looking at uh, a scope that's the global scope here, and we've defined a variable, let x equal one. And then we're going to create a function. I'll name this parent function. And we'll make it an arrow function. And inside the parent function, we'll have a local scope that is local to this function. And here I'm going to define a variable called my value and set it equal to two. Now the parent function here is a child of the global scope. And so it has access to the value of X that we'll go ahead and log to the console. And it also has access to the my value variable that we just defined. However, the global scope, if we were to try to log the value of my value here in the global scope, we would get a reference error because it does not have access to the variables defined in the local scope of this parent function. So I'll go ahead and save this. And if we call the parent function underneath, we'll see the results of this. And we get a one and two in the console. However, this isn't defining uh, nearly as much as we need to yet. So let's go ahead and create a child function within the parent function. And then this nested function will have access to the global scope. So we can say x and add five to it with the plus equals. And then we can also access the my value variable from the parent function. And we can go ahead and add one to that. And so this child function has access to the values from its parent function and the global scope. And this is lexical scope. This is how we're applying the nested child functions having access to the scope of their parent functions. And it doesn't just stop at the parent. They can go to the global as well. So we can go ahead and call the child function inside of the parent function. And then when I save, we get all of these values returned to the console. So our initial one and two on lines 13 and 14 are one and two here. And then on lines 17 and 18, we get five added to X, so we get six. And then on line 18, we get three because we've added one to my value. But this does not display closure. Although we can say the child function has closure over the scope of the parent function because it has access to it, and we could even say the child function has closure over the global scope, it does not directly uh, give an example of closure. It's just lexical scope is an important part of closure. It is not actually showing what closure is. So we need to change our example to actually display closure. A good definition of closure actually comes from the W3Schools website. And it says a closure is a function having access to the parent scope. And again, that is lexical scope, but it's only an important piece here. So a closure is a function having access to the parent scope even after the parent function has closed. And that is the key ingredient for giving an example of closure. And to further expand on this, we can say a closure is created when we define a function, not when a function is executed. And for an analogy here, Think of a professional sports game, uh, football, I'm in America, so my football may be different than yours, baseball, tennis, anything that requires a field. Those boundaries are set before the game is played. 
And that's how you can think about a closure. It is created when we define the function, or you could say the boundaries are set. We're telling child function what it has closure over at the time that it is defined. It is defined within the parent function, and so that is giving the child function access to not only its local scope, but it also has access to the parent function scope, and it has access to the global scope. So it could be said that it has closure over all three. But now we just need to give an example of what it means to have access to a parent scope even after the parent function has closed. And this is the key part right here. So now let's change this function and we'll give the child function access to these scopes even after the parent function has closed. In order to do this, instead of calling the child function inside the parent function, we actually need to return the child function. And we don't want to call the child function, so we're actually just returning the child function from the parent function when it is called. And so now if we set, I'll just call this result, if we set result equal to the parent function, and then I go ahead and save, notice what we get in the console. We don't get any result from the child function or what we would expect here on lines 21 and 22. It hasn't been called into action. We just returned the function itself. So all we got was what's on line 17 and 18 when the parent function was called into action here, but it returns the child function. So now we can use result to call the child function. And actually, to further highlight what I'm saying, if I just log what result is, you can see it is our child function. And since it's an arrow function, it's an anonymous function, and it was just referred to as child function. So we just get the anonymous function here in the console. So now we can call the child function as result, and it has access to the my value variable, even though the parent function has already been called and closed. It is already returned. And so now when I save and I call result, you can see lines 21 and 22, we get six and three. And that means because my value was not defined inside the child function. So although the parent function has already returned, it is already closed, the child function still has access to the scope. And that makes my value a private variable that only child function has access to. Further, if we call result again, you may be surprised at the result. Notice it's not six and three again, it's 11 and four. It continued to increment these values. So we incremented my value by another one. So now it is four. And instead of six, we added another five. And so now we have 11. And if we call result again, it will continue to increment. And that is because it is incrementing both of these values and it has access to the global scope which is a public variable, but it also has access to the scope of its parent function, which is a private variable. And to further highlight that, if we want to go ahead and log to the console the value of x, we can still do that. And as we got the last value of x, which is 16. But if we try to log to the console, the value of my value, we should get a reference error because it is a private variable. And that's exactly what happens. My value can only be accessed from the child function unless we were to call the parent function again, which at this point, we're not going to because we've already set result equal to that. So this is a good way to create a private variable and then only have access to it with a child function. So that is closure because we have access to the scope of the parent function even after the parent function has returned. Let's look at another example. 
I'm going to create an example with an immediately invoked function expression. That's IIFE. And you often see closure examples with IIFEs. If you haven't seen one of these before, I'll quickly run through what an immediately invoked function expression is. Here I'll define private counter. I'm going to set it equal to an arrow function, but I'm going to put that arrow function inside parentheses. And then after I have this initial definition inside here, I'm going to call it into action immediately by putting the parentheses operators right after it. And so this will call this function into action immediately. And that is an immediately invoked function expression. I'm going to set count equal to zero, and then I'm going to log to the console a template literal that says initial value. And here I'll put the count value inside this template literal. And after that, I'm going to return an anonymous function. And here I'm going to set the count plus equals, so we'll increment it by one. And then I'm going to log the value of count. And after that, I'll go ahead and save the function. And we see in the console, I have initial value equal to zero. Why did that happen? Because this function was already invoked. It's an immediately invoked function expression. So now private counter is equal to this function. So it's essentially what we did before with the named functions, except I didn't have to set result equal to the name of a function. We just invoked it immediately. And now if we call private counter afterwards, We'll see now we have a value of one. So count was incremented and then we just logged it to the console. And if we do that again and again, we'll continue to increment our counter, but we're using a private variable to do so. This is not available in the global scope. The only way that this variable can be accessed is through the, the lexical scope of the child function here, this anonymous function. And so it has closure over the private counter scope. And of course it has closure over the global scope. However, all we'd really need here is having closure over the private counter scope so we can have our private variable that increments the counter. It's important to highlight that this console log statement only happens once. This original function that is called into action immediately only returns one time. And it only returns this function to private counter one time. After that, when we call private counter, we're calling this function. And that is why we only see the console log that says initial value in the console one time. After that, every time we call private counter, we get the return value or the console log actually of the count value here. So if I were to remove our private counter calls and save once again, we just get the initial value console log statement here. This function is returned, but it is not called into action immediately. It is only called into action with the calls to the private counter. Okay, let's look at one more example with an immediately invoked function expression that will give us another example of closure. And in this example, I'll go ahead and give us a little extra room. In this example, I'm going to define a function called credits. Reminds me of when I used to go to the arcade and put money in the games, but we want to pass in a parameter. And so we're going to need some credits to play an arcade game, but we have a limited number of credits. And this is, an immediately invoked function as well. And so at the end, we call the operator parentheses to call it into action, but we need to pass in, oh, and I've got a minus and still a equal sign there. We need to pass in the parameter immediately since this is immediately invoked. So let's say we start out with three quarters. And so to do that, when the function is invoked, you pass in the parameter in the operators at the end. So we're passing in three credits immediately. So here we'll say let credits 
equal, oh, that was a minus again, equal num. And from there, we'll log the initial credits value and we'll log the credits. I'm going to return an anonymous function. And this anonymous function is going to take credits and instead of plus equals one, it's going to say minus equals one and subtract a credit for every time we spend a credit. And then if the credits are greater than zero, we'll log to the console and we can say plain game and we'll include credits in this template literal and we'll say credits remaining. And then we'll also have another if statement. We'll say credits less than or equal to zero. And we can say console log. And here we'll just say not enough credits. So just an example of how we can actually subtract with a function. And if we save this, we get our initial credits value of three, but we're not subtracting or playing a game yet. So we need to call credits for that to happen. And we've already passed in our value, our starting value of three credits. So now when we call credits and save, we get playing game, two credits are remaining. And likewise, we can go ahead and copy this line down. And now you can see we played a game, we had two credits remaining, then we played again, we had one credit remaining, and then when we wanted to play, there were not enough credits. And here you can see how credits is the private variable that is accessed because this anonymous function that we return from our immediately invoked function, this anonymous function has closure over the immediately invoked function that has the private credits variable because this credits variable is private, it's not available in the global scope and the only way to access it is through the child function that is an anonymous function here. Well, I hope these examples have helped you understand closure and if you were not previously familiar with lexical scope, I hope it has also helped you understand how it is not closure, but lexical scope is an important part of closure. And after that, of course, remember in the description, I have a link to my tutorial on scope. Thank you so much for watching and liking, supporting, sharing, all of those things. Please leave comments below. I'm curious if you have questions or if you have another definition that you think nicely sums up closure as well. I'll talk to you guys again very soon.